Um, so I'm a little surprised that, honestly, 10 years ago I would never have believed I would have been here. Uh, my background isn't in healthcare, it's actually in astronautics and space engineering. Um, there was an event in my life um, a few years ago, actually about a week after this photo was taken, that really uh, impacted me very significantly. And uh, like many people in the healthcare field, I left the space industry and I moved into healthcare because of the experience that my family and I had gone through. So this photo was taken back in 2006. Um, I was in the space industry, I was launching and operating communication satellites. Hmm. That morning we'd actually had four different soccer games, so my husband and I had divided and conquered to uh, get to them all. And in the afternoon we came home, we were breaking leaves, the kids were jumping in the leaves, and we had an awesome day, our life was really great. So within a couple of days, uh, my oldest daughter Kate and my son Ben uh, developed flu symptoms, and then they broke out in bullseye rashes, and were very quickly diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease, um, but that started a very long 10 year journey for us through a maze of complex conditions and uh, healthcare situations that we had to manage. So um, I'm actually going to switch to a video of Kate because she tells the story far better than I do. Um, so if you just take a few minutes, I'm going to allow Kate to speak to that. My name is Kate Sheridan. I'm a graduate student at Oxford University studying comparative social policy. I'm also a patient who's had multiple chronic conditions. Over a decade ago, when I was in fifth grade, I suddenly developed flu symptoms and a classic bullseye rash on my face. I was quickly diagnosed with Lyme disease and treated with three weeks of oral antibiotics. <coughs> Despite what we thought would be a simple diagnosis and treatment, my health continued to decline, and over the next three years, I was referred to over 30 doctors, given 15 different diagnoses, and was hospitalized five times. Over that period, the disease progressed through my body, and my cognitive abilities and memory began to fade. I went from being a straight-A student in an advanced academic program to a special needs student unable to read a single page of a book. It moved through my limbs, swelling all of my joints and draining the energy from my body. I went from being a competitive athlete to bedridden. A hot, burning sensation began to flicker through my feet and up my legs, crackling across my back and my neck. My pain levels became excruciating, running between a seven and a nine out of 10 all the time for 18 months straight. I was just turning 14. Over those first three years, we built a team of six specialists, top in their field, who were dedicated to improving my health. But despite their help, I continued to get worse. My family and I were overwhelmed with everything. Appointments became a blur. We would walk in, our doctors would ask, what's changed over the last two months? And they would try to put into words everything from the R visit to adding supplements to a newly bought wheelchair to depression. I had received so many different diagnoses and treatments that trying to accurately communicate my medical history had become impossible. When my team referred us to yet another consultation, my parents spent weeks collecting and organizing the medical data in an effort to tell my story more effectively. This was the turning point in my care. By changing the way we communicated, utilizing my data, and finding a more holistic approach to my treatment, we were able to build stronger relationships with my providers and better the way we care for me at home. One of the most vital components in improving my care was learning how to capture changes in my condition and communicate them effectively with my doctors. I was coping with lots of general mental and physical symptoms, not to mention side effects. It could be hard to describe to even the most attentive and understanding of doctors. Sometimes I didn't even think about a symptom as a symptom because I've been dealing with it for so long and it kind of just become part of my new baseline. During one particular appointment with my cardiologist, he mentioned he was surprised I didn't have any numbness or tingling in my feet. I was laying on the examination table and I responded that I had had numb feet for weeks. I just didn't think it was important enough to mention. I mean, I was in constant pain, I felt like passing out every time I stood up. I wasn't really thinking about my numb feet. <coughs> That night, my parents sat me down and made a full list of all of my symptoms, head to toe. There were 26 of them. We were shocked. I had never mentioned more than 10 in a single appointment. And so my mom set up a basic Excel tracker, and every week or two and four appointments, I would fill in the severity of my symptoms. We would give that data to my doctors for four appointments, pointing out any changes to my condition since our last visit. That one appointment with my cardiologist made us realize why tracking my health data at home was so important. Being able to collect that information ahead of time ensured that I could visualize everything fully and share everything I needed to with my doctor. I could set goals and track my progress towards them. And I finally had something to back up the gut feeling that something was off. When progress was slow and it felt like my treatment was plateauing, 
the data helped encourage me that things were still getting better. And when things declined, it was still beneficial to see. Sometimes between my myriad of symptoms, it could be hard for me to identify and communicate exactly what was getting worse. Small changes in my condition could mean an infection or a bad reaction to meds, and catching those changes early prevented a trip to the emergency room. The data helped legitimize what I was feeling and gave me confidence in evaluating and communicating my own state of health. Data has power. We produced this chart from my voice. If you dive into it, you'll find a student, an artist, an athlete, and a daughter. Those lines begin to be doubting I would ever be able to live independently, and they end with me applying to college. I can't tell you how powerful it is to be able to hold that journey in my hands. There are many other patients out there who have far crazier stories than mine, but who don't have the tools to share them. We can change that. Literally five years ago, Kate was starting her fifth year of high school, and my husband and I were starting to discuss converting the basement into an apartment because we really didn't believe that she would barely get through high school, let alone go to college. And I have to tell you that I, I was actually delighted when I saw that uh, Patricia Brennan was going to be here today because when we were in the worst of our battles, I saw a quote that she had when she was at the working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And the quote says, people are experts in everyday living. Physicians are experts in clinical care and technology bring them together. And I want to focus on that first sentence for a second because that first sentence so resonated with me. People are experts in everyday living. And what I realized was that my kids and chronic patients are experts in everyday living with chronic conditions. So my kids were 8 and 11 when they first got infected, but they were experts. They were the only ones who could articulate and explain exactly what their illness was doing to them. They were the only ones who could explain if a coping skill was actually working and making a difference. They're the only ones who could describe how their illness was impacting their life, their social life, their friends, their ability to do the things that they loved. And my husband and I have become expert caregivers with time. We learned how to advocate on their behalf. It got to a point where the first few minutes of waking up in the morning, watching how they moved, watching how they responded, we were pretty accurate in being able to predict if they were actually going to be able to go to school and make it through, or if we were going to get a phone call in those first few minutes. But here was the big disconnect for me, and this is actually why I shifted careers. The disconnect for me is, I don't know any other experts who have no tools to support them. In the 99% of time that they're applying their expertise, Patients are at home managing their own chronic conditions for the majority of the time. They're in the clinic for about this amount of time. So we're all experts in this room. How many of you apply your trade without any health IT right now? Anyone? So how many of you have been released from the ER or a hospital stay? So how many, have, how many of you have been chronic patients who've been in that situation? So when you left that hospital, for that appointment, how many of you left with a piece of paper? <laughs> yeah. So that's the disconnect for me. Patients are experts. We give them no tools to help them apply that expertise. And that was actually the big aha moment for me that made me leave the space industry. And I joined MITRE. We're a not-for-profit organization. We partner with federally funded research and development centers and also um, uh, public private, private partnerships. But we do independent research. And I put a research proposal into my and I said, I want to find a way to empower patients, to allow them to have a voice and bring their expertise to bear. So I want to take a moment, patient voice. I mean, the title of the presentation that I'm giving today is How to Convert the Patient Voice into Hard Data. And I want to talk about patient voice for just one second, because we hear about patient-generated data all the time. But when you hear about the context of that data, most of the time right now is around wearable devices and monitor devices. Blood pressure, right? weight, glucose levels, very, very important information and data. But people aren't talking about the other type of patient-generated data, what we call active patient-generated data, the patient voice. So I want to differentiate between that. When I walk into a doctor's appointment, when my daughter walked into a doctor's appointment, as you heard earlier, when Grace walked into her doctor's appointments, we verbalize the information that we have that is critical to, uh, to impact the provider's decisions. And, and that's the type of data that I'm talking about. 
We want to bring the patient voice, that active patient generated data, to bear in a way that we can leverage it for better outcomes. I also want to hit on another thing. Patient data isn't always through words. It's not always through information. So Katie had a lot of pain. She was running 79 pain levels for 18 months straight. Hot school and joints, it was brutal. She was a teenager, she was in high school. But she got used to it. Her tolerance was incredibly high and she didn't want to look like a sick kid. So she put on a front and she showed to very few people what that felt like. My real understanding of what that was doing to her was that picture that she created on the left that just showed the pain. The only one I saw in that picture that she did in art that I was like, oh my god, you know, I, I knew her pain was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. The picture in the middle is what made me realize the implication of that pain had on her emotional state. And the picture on the far right showed me the difficulties of walking into school with a pick line, having an infusion pump in a bag and trying to look normal around her friends. So when we think about the patient voice, we need to think about the different modalities that patients can communicate through. It's not always just through words. Sometimes words are hard. Sometimes it's through images and pictures and voices and art. So Kate mentioned the turning point in her care when my husband and I sort of stepped in and we really started pulling the data together. We were really overwhelmed. She had not only Lyme disease, but she was also diagnosed with an autoimmune condition and it triggered dysautonomia, actually. Um, we heard about that this morning. She had multiple complex conditions. We went out, we collected all of her data from all of her providers. We took that data, we put it into spreadsheets, and we started tracking her patient-generated data, her patient voice in those spreadsheets as well, at home between appointments. And then we took that data and we made it into one 11 by 17 sheet of paper to tell the story more effectively. And there were different pieces of information in that story. So that there was her symptom load and how her symptoms had been changing with time. It showed her medications that had been tried so you could start to see how the, how the symptoms changed with the medications. And we also even added some of the clinical data across the top so you could see the abnormal lab results that had prevented her providers from continuing the different treatments. And it was that approach and method that we used that really helped turn her around. But we're one family and we were able to do this for our children because we were really lucky. We had the resources, we had the education, we had the support. But there's 117 million chronic patients and their caregivers out there who equally deserve to have that voice. And that's the research that we've been looking at. How do you capture that voice? How do you help patients empower them to have their own voices to be able to fully participate? So our research was in three sort of phases. The first phase we did was we actually went out and we, and we, we researched the needs of complex chronic patients. There were three main gaps that we found. The first one is, I mentioned before, patients at home 99% of their time managing their own conditions. They have few to no tools, right? There's a whole bunch of tools being shown on our uh, exhibit floor right now, but most patients at home don't have any of them. But they really are managing their care today with a piece of paper. That is a disconnect. The second piece was patients really wanted to be able to heard. They wanted to be able to talk more effectively with their doctors. They wanted to tell them when things were happening. They wanted to explain to them what was going on with them. And, and, and help to be able to do that. And the third one is they didn't want tools to help them. So there were three sort of key areas we were focusing on. And before we wanted to start building the tools to show how you could do this, we did some prior research. We collaborated with the University of Virginia um, and we actually did a clinical study with multiple sclerosis patients. We had those patients at home remotely track the severity of their symptoms with time. And then we also had them report on their symptoms in the clinic. But the reason we did this study was that there was a disbelief that when a patient tells you something at home and they're not in front of you talking to you, you might not be able to believe that data, right? And that part of that is because patients aren't viewed as experts today. So there was a distrust of the data. So through this clinical study, we were actually able to show definitively that not only can you feasibly collect the data at home, but it is as reliable as the data is if they're sitting in the chair in front of you telling it to you. We also found that the patients who track their symptom data at home between appointments have an increased understanding of their own disease state. So the second thing we did is we collaborated with Carnegie Mellon and we did a provider survey and we wanted to know from the providers what is the information that patients can provide, that only patients can provide, that would help you in your clinical decision making. And they said longitudinal symptom severity data and longitudinal medication compliance data. They knew what they were prescribing but they didn't know why the, whether the patients were taking it or not, and if they weren't, why. So based on this upfront research, we then started thinking about 
how do we develop the tools to support the patients in those three areas and capture the data in a way that we can leverage it. So we ended up building a tool so that we could do further clinical studies to, to verify the approach. I want to point something out. A lot of the time when we show the tool, they're like, oh, an app, you know, everything's about the app and it's about the widget. This isn't about the widget. Okay, I just want to start with that. I, I like Toolkit, it works really well, people really like it. It's not about the widget. Um, we didn't develop this as a tool to sell. We developed this because we need to show the capabilities that patients need to have in their hands in order to help them self-manage and communicate. So the, the app is very simply designed. It, it's designed through a schedule driven, so there's a schedule on the left-hand side to help patients remember when to take their meds, what they're taking. Um, the, from a usability standpoint, we use a test of this app with patients in rural Montana with complex chronic conditions between the ages of 46 and, and 76. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the actual people, the audience we were targeting were the ones who actually tested it. Within the app itself, some of the features that we've been researching, patients right now walk into their doctor's appointment and have off the top of their head have to remember all the stuff to tell the, the provider. They're saying, what are your symptoms? Okay, you get 26 symptoms. It's very hard for patients to be able to actually even identify the full set, let alone communicate the severity of them. So within the, the tool, there's a pick list of symptoms, and those symptoms cover all diagnoses. They cover um, psychological in addition to physical. The patient can go through the symptoms to help them identify a full set of symptoms. And then on a regular basis, they have their personalized tracker, and they can capture the severity of symptoms 0 through 10. So when they go into the appointment now, they can actually have a full set of information to share, and you can see how it's fluctuated since the last appointment. <laughs> the other thing we're capturing is medications. Um, importantly, there's a lot of app medications out there, and they give reminders. But within the tool, because the patient voice is important, we allow the patient to say, I'm going to skip the medication today. We skip medications for Katie some days when she had an exam in school. She had gone from a straight A student to a special needs student. If she had an exam on a certain day, there was a certain medication we didn't give her because she couldn't think if she was on that medication. And to fail that exam would have been devastating to her holistically. So we had a great reason for not taking it. What's important is, we can communicate to the doctor that we couldn't take and follow the treatment plan as written, and they can adapt the treatment plan to be something we could follow. So having tools that allow patients to capture the reasons why they're able to follow and not will then um, feed back into the system to allow better decisions moving forward. And then there's a, a visualization, there's a journaling effect. We know that when patients journal, it helps them, it helps organize information. The journal allows them to capture whatever they're thinking about, photographs, audios, text, but they can tag those entries as providers' notes. So when they walk into that appointment three months later, they're not randomly trying to remember everything they wanted to tell the provider. It's in the tool where they can walk through all those issues and show them the things that they wanted to communicate. Capturing the patient voice and helping the patient communicate effectively in a less stressful way in a much more accurate manner. But collecting data and making data available is fine, but if you can't use it, then it's not effective. So we have visualizations that allow the patients themselves to look at the data and see what's changing. What is the trend in their symptom data? Across the top is individual symptoms. The second row down is called the total symptom load of the patient. The burden of all of their symptoms on that patient. If that's higher, then there's more symptoms that are occurring. If it's lower, it's lower. So instead of just relying on your gut to figure out, should I call the doctor? You can look at your own data now to say, my symptoms are worsening, I should phone it, and here's what's driving that. So the idea of this visualization is you can start to see cause and effect. When I started that medication, is it helping me or not? Providers can use it. More importantly, the patients can use it to make decisions when they're at home. There's also a dashboard view. We're getting late, so I'm going to run through. Um, data standards, I want to touch on this. A lot of patient apps, we don't have a lot of data standards around patient-generated data, this type of patient-generated data. So within the tool, we've matched the symptoms to SNOMED CT. We've matched the medications to Rx norm. So when, when, and I say when, because this has to happen at some point, when we include this data in electronic health record systems, you can start to do analytics with it. You can start to combine it with clinical data, and you can start to leverage this patient voice as real hard data, just like we do clinical data. I have to wrap up very quickly, sorry. So um, it, the third phase that we've gone into is actually clinical studies to look at, evaluate how these sorts of tools integrate all the way through the healthcare process. So we've actually been doing clinical studies with the hospital out in Billings in Montana um, to actually understand how this data gets integrated into, for example, I'm going to skip through just because I know we're running late, 
um, how it gets integrated all the way through the workflow from both, both a patient's perspective and a clinician's perspective, and what are the clinicians looking at in their electronic health record system at the time at which they are leveraging this voice of this data. So the sustainability of these types of tools is critical that we consider how does this data get captured, integrated all the way through, leveraged by providers in a way that doesn't add burden to them. And then the other component that we're looking at is the policies that will incentivize the behaviors needed to actually leverage this data. So to so wrap up current state, we talk about patients in the center of care. This is, this is a phrase we hear all the time. Our research says, let's not have the patients in the center of care. Patients should actually be partners with care. They're equal partners with the care team. This is the model that allows us to act together and be as one for the patients to be included in that acting together. It's the model that allows our data to be shared. I'll share my data if you share your data. It's not just clinical data and monitor data. It's my voice and my data. This is the model that allows me to do that. And then you are as you live. This is the model where listening to the patients and hearing and understanding what they need to live their lives fully, not just about their medical conditions. This is the model that will bring us to that. So overall, what we're trying to do is, is critical. And my ask of you today is please, everything you're doing, start thinking about that patient voice, that active patient voice, and how we can include it in all the work that we're doing. We're really lucky to have been empowered. I'm incredibly proud of my daughter, that's Katie, when she certified EMT four years ago. Oh. Um, really, really proud of her. But let's enable um, all 170 million chronic patients to be empowered, to have that voice, and truly partner with their care teams. Thank you. Thank you. 